Okay. Yes. It seems to work. Yes. Okay. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks to the uh, organizer to have uh, allowed uh, a uh, talk about the electronic structure, temper temperature dependent band structure. And is it normal that I do not get uh, the? I do not see anything. Uh, Okay, that's not too important. Yes. Um, yes. Okay, so um, I would like to, to thank also the, the, the collaborator for uh, this talk, and including Samuel, who has been a PhD student with me during uh, four years. So, and then he went to uh, work with uh, Feliciano in uh, Oxford, but also um, Yannick Filet, uh, Jonathan Laflamme, Yes, uh, Anna Mio, uh, Michel Cote, Gabriel Antonius, Andrea Marini, Lucia Reining, Claude Boulanger, and Jean-Paul Neri Phil Allen at Stony Brook. Um, so, we all know that uh, spect um, the, the, the electronic and optical properties shift with uh, temperature and also uh, broaden. This is an example uh, of uh, taken for, for germanium of the uh, absorption uh, as a function of the frequency. At zero temperature, you get this uh, black line. But then uh, going to 300 uh, Kelvin or 825 Kelvin, you see that there is a shift in the peak and also a broadening. Uh, but not only there is a temperature uh, dependence, but even at zero Kelvin, the vibrational effects are important because there is also zero point motion. And this is an example for, for diamond, where um, the um, value here that includes zero point motion differs from the asymptotic behavior starting from uh, the linear region for the indirect excitonic uh, uh, gap by something that is on the order of 0 0.4 uh, electron volt. And usually, such effect is not included in density functional uh, calculation. Um, so it has been possible indeed in the, the last uh, 10 years uh, to obtain a good agreement with experiment. I take here um, a result from Andrea Marini uh, in which he, he computed the absorption uh, for, um, for silicon and observed, as you can see, uh, correct broadening and shift in the uh, spectrum. And concerning the, di the diamond stuff, uh, we have been working on, 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 on this. We were not uh, alone to do this. Actually, we observed that uh, the, 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 for the direct gap of uh, uh, um, diamond, uh, not only we need to do the calculation temperature dependence with DFT, but we actually need to do uh, to add the GW correction to the uh, electron phonon uh, coupling in order to obtain a good uh, correspondence. So um, now this um, correction, zero point motion correction, I must say is neglected while at the level of sophistication that we are working nowadays, the correction to density functional theory uh, electronic structure usually is made only by the GW uh, correction. Um, but the electron phonon coupling might give another 10%, uh, 20%, 30% 30 correction to uh, this GW uh, uh, correction. And this is uh, shown in, in, in this uh, figure. Um, Shishkin, Marsman, and Kresse in 2007 uh, computed by the best uh, technology that they could do. Uh, the band gap in uh, many uh, materials here. And especially for the light elements, they had still uh, something like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 error in their prediction. And actually, uh, it's, it is very likely that uh, the last bit of uh, the error comes from the, uh, from the phonons. So, uh, in my presentation, I will uh, go step by step. I will first discuss the thermal expansion and the phonon population effect. These are two different uh, effects. 
I will present the Abinicio Allen, Heine, and Cardona uh, theory, which is our workhorse nowadays. Um, this is actually based in, in all uh, known implementation on density functional uh, theory, but actually we can go beyond density functional theory and include the GW, GW correction to electron phonon. Uh, I will show you uh, that uh, one has to be cautious about infrared active material. This is linked with the uh, Frölich uh, part of the matrix for electron phonon uh, matrix element that has been mentioned already uh, in this uh, lecture. I will make a survey of uh, the present knowledge of zero point normalization uh, in the belt. And if I have time, I will uh, speak about spectral functions and the Frölich uh, Hamiltonian. So let's uh, start with something that is quite simple, the thermal expansion. Um, indeed, when considering um, the constant pressure temperature dependence of the electronic uh, eigen energies, one can divide it in two contributions. Because of temperature, the solid will expand or contract, but usually it's an expansion. And then we also might have uh, a, a contribution that is obtained at fixed volume, at fixed lattice parameter. Um, so constant volume, constant temperature, and uh, the thermal expansion plays a role uh, here. So I will refer to this constant volume uh, contribution as the phonon population uh, effect. And I will take this into account by looking at the thermal expansion. Uh, nowadays, it's quite easy to, to obtain. Indeed, perhaps some of you have already computed thermal expansion from a, a, a density functional theory. One compute the full phonon band structure at several uh, uh, different uh, volumes. One can extract the Grünhausen uh, parameters. And uh, after some uh, work, one can get, as a function of the temperature, the thermal expansion. In this graph, I have the experimental data uh, here. And uh, this thermal expansion was computed theoretically at different pressures. So the zero pressure curve must be in good agreement with the uh, experimental dot uh, crosses. And that's what's uh, happening, actually. This dates from 96, so you see 20 years ago, uh, this was uh, kind of hard to do, but nowadays it, it, it's quite easy. Now, uh, we can also uh, determine what is the eigenvalue change due to a change of volume. This is also very easy to do with uh, density functional theory. And combining these two ingredients, what do we obtain? Well, we obtain this uh, behavior, you see, as a function of the temperature, the change of the gap value. This is for uh, silicon. And actually, the experimental data precisely obtained by looking at the thermal expansion and separately at the uh, um, change of eigen energy due to a change of volume matches very well this uh, uh, calculation. But we see that at the level of 300 Kelvin, we have something like uh, zero change or perhaps one or two milli electron volt change in the, uh, in, in the gap. But by doing, on the contrary, without any volume constraint, we allow the full, um, um, sorry, we, we, we look at the full change in the electronic structure due to the temperature uh, dependence. What we obtain is actually 60 MeV from 0 Kelvin to 300 Kelvin. So the, the, the part that is simply due to the volume, the change of uh, volume due to temperature is negligible uh, in, in silicon. We have to look at something else. Hmm? I would like to mention that it's not always the case that the thermal expansion effect can be neglected. Uh, for black phosphorus and for this family, bismuth selenite, it has been shown that it can be 40% or 50% of the change of uh, the structure, uh, electronic structure due to the temperature. But this is mostly for uh, solids that are quite soft. Huh? For typical solids that are covalently bonded, that are very strong, uh, it will be negligible in general. So 
how understand then the phonon population effect? Here the situation can be quite complex. Um, one might actually gain a lot by trying to understand what is the classical effect of vibrations on the eigen energies. And we will indeed look at this. Uh, but the, this dynamics of the nuclei has to be treated in some approximation that might be classical approximation or quantum, uh, a, a quantum approach. The um, treatment of vibration might be done in the harmonic approximation as well as taking into account anharmonicities. Uh, we might uh, proceed with a non-adiabatic approach to this electron uh, phonon uh, interaction or simplify the thing using the adiabatic approach. Uh, finally, uh, shall we uh, deal with the uh, electronic quasiparticle as coming from the cone sham uh, electronic structure or from GW? And also, perhaps we might go beyond the quasiparticle uh, picture and include uh, uh, things beyond just the quasiparticle peak, namely a spectral function. Um, on the market, there are at least five uh, first principle methodologies, um, some of which are quite easy to understand. Time of rate, thermal of rate, I will show. And then one can make the harmony approximation and thermal of rate. Then, starting with something more elaborate, a diagrammatic, diagrammatic approach, which uh, corresponds to the Alan, Heine, and Cardona. And then, very recently, Hardy Gross has proposed the exact factorization but this I will not speak uh, about. To illustrate these things, I will take a, a toy model. Um, diatomic molecules are sufficiently simple for this purpose. They have discrete levels. They are simple molecule, uh, molecular orbitals. And only one relevant vibration mode, so quite simple. Huh? The sixth mode that should be present actually decouples the three translation, two rotation, and the stretch. So um, what if we work in the born oppenheimer approximation and simply follow the eigen energy, um, be it the, the highest occupied molecular uh, orbital or the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, as a function of um, the bond length between the two nuclei? We have represented uh, here for the monox carbon monoxide, blue, the eigen energy of the HOMO, and for H2, the same uh, eigen energy of the HOMO as a function of the bond length variation. Now, you might imagine that when there will be vibration of the uh, distance between these two nuclei, um, the eigen energy of H2 will simply fluctuate around the equilibrium uh, uh, geometry. But then its average position, the eigen energy, will apparently not change because it's very linear, as you can see. So the average will still be zero. There is actually a small curvature, small curvature here, yeah, small curvature there, and it is because of that curvature that on the average, the eigen energy will change. Actually, the message here is to tell you that the change of eigen energy due to a vibration is due to the curvature of the eigen energy with respect to uh, displacement. Second order derivative of the eigen energy with respect to uh, a displacement. OK, so you understand in this uh, approach, in which one might make the time average of eigen energies from molecular dynamics trajectories uh, with this uh, uh, expression, that we can indeed compute a temperature dependent eigen uh, energy on the average, something that is statistical. There are some good things about this. It's well defined, it's compatible with QL implementation and computing capabilities. One can consider the eigen energy from DFT as well as from GW. Anharmonicities might be taken into account. Huh? So you imagine to take uh, a, a piece of material, but then you have to think, mm, I have to include all possible phonon vibrations, so I have to take a large supercell to include all these phonons. Huh? 
And indeed, this is a, 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 a problem. Uh, another problem is that usually one is doing classical dynamics. So what about the zero point motion? Uh, uh, there is no exchange of energy between the, uh, the, the classical, uh, sorry, the born of an Emmer approximation simulation and the, the, the phonon. And so it's hard for solid, not only because we have to deal with a supercell, but also because it's difficult then to disentangle the eigen energies from that or that k point from any other. The supercell, the vibration in the supercell will mix all wave vectors with one uh, another. Okay, so it's possible to identify the the gap extrema, but not to obtain easily uh, unless one is doing an unfolding. But this might be a bit difficult. Uh, to identify the specific change due to the temperature of a particular K point in the brilliant zone. Yes? Uh, you say that uh, the ship uh, has the uh, average value of the uh, position of the ship, the temperature of the position of the ship. Exact. No, no, you can do this uh, in, in, in a solid, yes, uh, indeed, and it has been, uh, it has been done. Uh, don't be mistaken. At the equilibrium geometry, it's the total energy that has, that has a minimum. But each eigenvalue will have first a linear behavior, be it in one sense, uh, one direction or the other, and a secondary curvature. Is it okay with, for you? Okay, you are thinking, for example, to uh, solids that are highly symmetric, uh, because in most solids, when you will uh, that f uh, kind of um, decreased uh, symmetry, uh, you do not have all the, the position fixed by symmetry, and there will be uh, some eigen energy change associated with most of the most of the phonons. But then, uh, even for silicon, when you change the uh, position of uh, one atom, you will split the, for example, the top of the valence band. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in general, you have a linear component. There are some cases in which you do not have such a linear component. The message that I want to, to make is, in any case, it's related to the curvature of the eigen, of the eigen energy. So um, next possibility would be to use um, the um, phone, well, quantum vibrational states and make a statistical uh, computation of the eigen energy when you have not randomly displaced uh, uh, um, position, but you would weight this uh, displacement with a statistical uh, uh, state. Um, this means that you include zero point uh, motion, but it might be hard to sample more than a few vibrational degrees of freedom. Uh, uh, Still, the other problems of the previous approach are there. The alternative, as done by uh, Feliciano, uh, actually uh, very recently, is to consider one very large supercell with prepared atomic displacement at look at the uh, uh, spectrum. So it's feasible and interesting uh, in any case. But we, that's not what we will do uh, here. And then um, we can work in the harmonic approximation and expand the eigen energies to second order. There, we will have uh, Bose-Einstein occupation of the, uh, the, 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 the phonon, uh, degrees of freedom. And as I emphasize, we need this curvature with respect to uh, an atomic displacement. And we get a formula that is quite um, um, neat. The change uh, of eigen energy is due to temperature will have some component coming directly from the Bose-Einstein occupation number, including the one-half uh, zero-point motion. And this uh, coupling, 
actually comes directly from this curvature. I will call this quantity the electron phonon coupling energy. It is somehow the change of eigen energy that is brought by the occupation of a selected uh, phonon uh, mode. It's still uh, something that uh, needs a uh, supercell, so it's still hard, but it starts to be uh, a bit easier to, 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 to manage. Um, it is a, a bit more tractable uh, in any case. Actually, we are on the way to the Hallam, Heine, and Cardona uh, theory. This was actually a, a, a theory uh, coming whose basics come from uh, the 50s. Huh? Um, in the semi-empirical context of the, of the 50s, Fan propose uh, one technique that we call now, uh, that is associated with what we call now the Fan uh, uh, self-energy. So in diagrammatic uh, language, this is the uh, diagram. And then a few years later, and independently, Anton Schick proposed uh, something that was linked to what he called the Debye Waller uh, uh, contribution that we know now to be coming from this diagram. But apparently at that time, these people did not realize that they were different objects. And some people were thinking, ah, I can do either the Dibai Waller or the fan approach, it should be uh, the same. Actually, it's not completely true because uh, this guy, Brooke, realized that both had to be uh, used together, but this was published in an obscure, well, only in a PhD thesis at, at, at Yale. And this was not noticed by anybody, apparently. So uh, it was not until Allen and High and then Cardona realized that both diagrams should be combined, that seems obvious, but that was not so obvious, apparently, that uh, the, the theory was uh, completed. And that's why it's called the Allen, Heine, and Cardona theory, while we are speaking of, of Fan and uh, the Bywaller uh, uh, diagram. So, how is it obtained? Well, uh, we are doing second order, because it's a curvature, time-dependent perturbation theory, no average contribution from first order. I will show here equation for solids, so including the, the phonons, which will make the notation a bit cumbersome, but I will try to highlight important uh, things only. If we work in the adiabatic born oppenheimer uh, approximation, something that I will wave uh, at a later stage, we obtain a formula that is very similar to the one that we have seen. The change in Eigen energy is due to the comp contribution of all phonons, all branches in the Brillouin zone, weighted by this occupation number from Bose-Einstein statistics. And the coefficient here, the electron phonon coupling energy, can be written down and has a curvature contribution and then also a phonon mode factor. So this phonon mode factor will depend on the particular Eigen mode uh, corresponding to the, uh, to the phonon. So blue and violet, as you see, and we will work on, especially on the blue uh, uh, part. How can we con uh, compute this uh, curvature, the Eigen value change? Well, we start from uh, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian giving the Eigen energy. And this Hamiltonian in density functional theory as the kinetic energy, the potential created by the nucleus, and then the heart tree and exchange correlation uh, contribution. A first derivative will be very easy thanks to the hellman feynman theorem. I will not uh, discuss it. I think you, you, you all know this. I have simply to take into account the first order change of the Hamiltonian and get the expectation value with respect to unperturbed uh, wave function. Then when one takes a, a second uh, derivative, the Hamiltonian will acquire indeed a second order uh, derivative if I'm not changing the wave function. And this corresponds to, in the time-dependent uh, language, to the, the Bywaller or Anton Schick uh, diagram with a second order electron phonon uh, vertex. While uh, derivation with respect to psi zero 
will give uh, this other uh, contribution with psi one, the first order change of wave function with respect to atomic displacement and its complex conjugate. And this corresponds, loosely speaking, to a fan uh, self-energy. So you see how these things appear. Then, um, actually, it's possible to do something very nice um, in the, the framework of uh, Alain and Heine and, and Cardona. They realize uh, that the nucleus potential was a sum of separate contribution from each atom. And moreover, they use semi-empirical pseudo-potential, not the R3 and exchange correlation uh, corrections. So they simply move the potential, and uh, this empirical potential uh, would follow. That's called the rigid ion uh, approximation, which means that when I'm doing a derivative across the relative respect to one atom and to another atom, this vanishes. Because I should consider that this nucleus potential comes from separate atomic uh, contribution. In mathematical terms, one can observe that the second order Hamiltonian is pure site diagonal. This thing for different atoms is zero. And then they used also the invariance under pure translation that says that the second order derivative of energy when I move the crystal as a whole do not change at all. But one can also compute this change of eigen energy as coming from a fan term and the debye -Weller, weller term. So these two must vanish. And thanks to this some rule, they could reformulate the debye -Weller term in terms of first order electron phonon uh, uh, expression. So I give you the, uh, the, the, the full expression here. The electron phonon coupling energy comes from the fan and the debye -Weller. In the rigid ion approximation, both use the same electron phonon uh, coupling energy, but with different phonon factors. I will not go into uh, the map. At this stage, you are very happy because only first order electron phonon matrix elements are needed, which are standard ingredients of uh, first principle phonon band structure calculation. We can show that. Uh, we don't need to do any supercell calculation to obtain these uh, quantity, thanks to the FPT. Still, something which appears to be bad is that there is a summation over a large number of unoccupied state n prime appearing in the denominator here that gives the electron phonon coupling energy, which is uh, something typical of perturbation uh, theory. Then there are other questions. Is the rigid ion approximation valid for first principle calculation? I will not speak about it. We have worked, uh, we have a paper about it. The answer is apparently it's not important. Of course, um, if we are doing first principle calculation, the electron phonon matrix 11 will usually come from DFT. It's uh, not very easy to obtain from uh, many body perturbation uh, theory. And then a last point. We are doing the adiabatic approximation uh, here. Phonon frequencies are neglected in the denominator, but this I will waive uh, later. OK. Um, about the very first problem, um, yes. Summation over a large number of unoccupied states. One key point in doing an efficient calculation of this quantity is to remove completely the sum over empty states. And this is implemented in Abinit that I'm using. It's the only code that has this uh, Sternheimer uh, rewriting of the Alan, Heine, and Cardona uh, theory. That brings roughly an order of magnitude speed up with respect to a simple sub sum over a, uh, a matrix element. Um, then, what we did is uh, to compute the zero point normalization in diamond, and I, I will then go on with the temperature dependence. We, I skip all the technical details because mainly one point is delicate, is the sampling on the wave vector of the phonon for the fan 
center. Why is it so? I have here a denominator that look at the difference between the eigenenergy that we would like to know uh, the temperature dependence and all eigenenergies, electronic eigenenergies that are present. I'm really saying all. This means you might come, uh, we have to consider all um, wave vectors, also all bands, including one's own band, the same band as the, uh, uh, the state that we would like to, uh, to compute the, the temperature dependence. So this quantity can be very small. And I illustrate this uh, for, for diamond. Look at the top of the valence band. Of course, there is a curvature of the Hagen energy. And if you look at the contribution of uh, an Hagen energy that is very, very close to, to that top of the valence band, the energy is really nearly close to it. And actually, it deviates from the top, the maximum, only quadratically. And I find such a difference at the denominator. So I gain a factor that behaves like 1 over q squared for such small uh, differences. And I have to integrate over the whole Brillouin zone. Can you integrate a 1 over q squared behavior over three space, a three-dimensional space? The answer is yes, because you have a q square uh, uh, volume element in your integral. So it is possible to obtain indeed a finite uh, number, but nevertheless, it is a div diversion. So one has to be really careful in doing this uh, integration. Hmm? Then for the, um, um, this point at gamma, the, the valence band minimum, there are other possibilities of diverging denominator at all these um, Again, uh, well, wave vector, we have exactly the same uh, uh, energy, and this will also be present in the denominator, and we have to do something in order to integrate properly uh, this um, uh, denominator. But the divergence is less severe. Um, indeed, by doing explicitly uh, the, the, the calculations, one can see uh, so uh, the band structure is, is here. And uh, we would like to um, obtain the uh, electron phonon coupling energy for that point. This is represented uh, here. And one sees indeed that there are divergences close to gamma. And for that point, every time we are crossing uh, another wave vector with the same energy, there is again uh, um, a divergence. So it's such a function that we have to uh, integrate. Um, typically, it's possible to arrange the thing by adding a small plus i delta in the denominator, a small imaginary uh, quantity that dramatically helps the convergence. Of course, it will be to a slightly different value, so one should make sure that the delta here uh, is sufficiently uh, small and that the integral over Q is sufficiently uh, uh, fine. But uh, with 100 MeV and considering Q grit that uh, increase by up, up to something like 100 million in the full Brillouin zone, uh, so 3,000 in the irreducible Brillouin zone, it's possible to see here uh, that the conversion is quite quick for the valence band maximum, and while for the conduction band maximum, minimum, sorry, it is not as good, but still at the end we obtain only a variation of one or two percent with respect to the uh, converge uh, value. And we obtain a uh, zero point homogenization of the gap, which is on the order of 0 0.4 um, EV in diameter. Changing the imaginary delta, you see it is here in the horizontal uh, axis. We could do it quite well, 
by going to exquisitely fine grids like 70, 70, uh, 75, 75, 75, or 125, 125, etc., for the conduction band, for the valence band, and moreover, we could know, could deduce what was the uh, exact uh, asymptotic behavior with respect to uh, this delta, and see, uh, well, and get uh, very nicely uh, uh, con converging uh, a value. So we also did um, comparison with another code, uh, quantum espresso plus uh, Yambo, uh, and obtain an agreement at the level of such a complicated quantity uh, that was uh, less than one milli electron volt over uh, 400 uh, milli uh, electron volt. Note that in this comparison, actually, we both used 300 bands to make the summation of our bands because Yambo cannot use the Steiner trick. Uh, in our case, we, we wanted simply to compare exactly with uh, Yambo, but actually, afterwards, we can only uh, do the calculation with Abinit with about a dozen of uh, bands and we obtain the same uh, uh, value, the same converged uh, value. So this is the result of uh, the diamond temperature uh, dependence of the, of the band gap. And uh, yes, as a function of the temperature, you see uh, the theoretical for the indirect or direct band gap and the experimental data, which are not completely in line with the theoretical uh, data. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that we have based our calculation density functional theory. Actually, um, I will show you later, doing the calculation with GW allows to get something much better. In any case, this is the uh, band structure dependence on the temperature here, the zero point motion uh, already affects the, the, the black line, which is without any electron phonon uh, uh, here, to become at the level of the uh, conduction band, the red line, with also the width that has been indicated, is the, 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 the gamma uh, that one has already heard about uh, earlier. Uh, so zero temperature, uh, 300 temperature, uh, 900 temperature and 1,500 uh, uh, Kelvin. Okay. Now, as promised, I will show you that going to GW allows to obtain a better um, um, fit with uh, experimental data. So, um, indeed, uh, we, we know that the gap of silicon in the density functional theory uh, is only 0 0.6 EV, while it is uh, 1.17 uh, experimentally, and the GW gap is 1.2. So what we did is to compute uh, the electronic structure of uh, uh, silicon in, um, so in, in diamond, uh, in supercells, in which we had frozen uh, phonons, so according to the other theories than the Alan, Heine, and Carbone. This was quite heavy computationally, but uh, it worked. So we computed this curvature explicitly using the GW electronic structure with respect to phonon in And here are some results for the electron phonon coupling energies um, as a function of the wave vector for the top of the valence band and bottom of the conduction band, DFT, G0, W0, and even self-consistent uh, GW uh, approximation. One can see that uh, in some points, the difference between DFT and GW is quite large. There, there, also there, and there. While the difference between the self-consistent GW and G0, W0 is quite small, there, there, here, also. So a G0, W0 uh, calculation is, is fine. And then using these matrix uh, elements, it was possible to obtain the correct curvature, correct temperature dependence of the optical uh, band gap. So 
with this uh, work that was done already a few years ago, we went on to look at many other materials. And there, we've met with some problems. Let's favor the other uh, side now. Uh, so indeed, we started to look at boron nitride. And there, um, as a function of the number of Q points that we are using for the grid, um, we first compute it with the same uh, imaginary factor in the denominator, 100 MeV. And we observe a very nice convergence to 200 uh, milli electron volt for the valence band renormalization. But then we divided the smearing factor by a factor of two, and we obtain this curve that was also smooth, but it was going to 250 MeV. Hmm, 25% change, that's a bit large. Huh? So we decrease it again increasing the, 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 the number of Q point to 10 MeV. And look at what we observe, 400 MeV. One MeV, whoa, 700 uh, MeV. So we could not converge our value for the zero point normalization. Something was surprising uh, here. Then, of course, we have understood what was going on and we can see now that uh, the dependence on the delta value is one over square root of delta. So when delta tends to zero, we have indeed a, di a divergence. Huh, why is it so? Well, when there are optic modes that are infrared active, they are accompanied by electric field. An electric field corresponds uh, to uh, a, a potential that diverges like 1 over Q. I have some equations here just to substantiate what, what I'm saying here, but I will not describe in detail this, the, these uh, equations. And so such a diver divergence, 1 over Q, appears in the electron phonon matrix element. Actually, it was uh, described already, I guess, by uh, uh, Feliciano and, 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 and other here. Um, so, when one look at the fan uh, contribution, not only one has two first-order electron phonon matrix elements that for such infrared active optic mode diverge like 1 over Q, but one has also at the denominator, like for diamond, a 1 over Q square divergence. So, we have to combine these divergences that together give a divergence like 1 over Q to the fourth power. Can you integrate a 1 over Q4 divergence in three dimensional? No. So that was normal. This theory breaks down. So we realized that actually we had to go to the non-adiabatic AHC theory because there we have phonon frequencies at the denominator that will actually shift one divergence with respect to the other. They won't combine to obtain a one over Q to the four. And so the whole theory can be uh, integrated. Okay? Um, then with such a fun uh, self-energy, so the basic message is that the people in the 70s doing the Hallan, Hein, and Cardona uh, theory never included such uh, uh, non-adiabatic uh, correction. They were by hand putting an I delta and doing calculation for polar materials. Actually, all these calculations were completely wrong. It was something that would depend on their value of delta. By change, they used a delta that was 100 MeV on the order of a typical phonon. Uh, value, phone on frequency, but it was just something lucky. Okay? So, uh, having, uh, sorry, having uh, self uh, energies, one can then do uh, several approximations on the mass shell approximation, quasi particle approximation, or even one can compute uh, spectral uh, functions. Mm -hmm. 
Um, here I show some results that were obtained uh, while converged for aluminum nitride, boron nitride, as well as for carbon and, and silicon. You see the size of these corrections uh, for the gap, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 in some case. Uh, then for silicon, it's much, uh, much smaller. Mm -hmm. But this is indeed the typical size of electron phonon zero point normalization. And um, we have recently looked at uh, many different uh, oxides. Um, I have here um, all FCC uh, materials, li uh, lithium, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, with the DFT band gap. Mm -hmm. And the valence band or conduction band minimum uh, shift due to uh, the, the, the electron uh, phonon. And you can see that uh, for this material, we obtained a 10% change of the DFT uh, gap. Some other changes would, were uh, uh, smaller. Since the GW correction might be 30%, 50%, but sometimes only 20%, you see that these corrections are not as large as the GW correction, but still they might be one third, one quarter of the GW correction by, by itself, which kind of, it's the next level uh, beyond GW to be uh, uh, included. Um, for some material like tin dioxide, the band gap is quite small, and there the zero point normalization is actually 22% of the band gap. So depending on the size, initial size of the band gap, this correction might relatively be quite uh, important. The picture uh, that appears nowadays is, is, is the following, um, done by different group, and I must say some group did not use the non-abiotic uh, uh, stuff, uh, did calculation with supercells, etc. So the quality of these calculations can widely vary, but still the global picture might be uh, um, the right one, that's what I believe. There is a class of materials for which uh, we have big shift uh, when there is some very light elements like hydrogen. Uh, it can be as large than one or two uh, EV. There is a very large class of material like oxide, nitrites, uh, material with carbon also, where the shift might be lower than 1 EV, but bigger than 0 0.2 EV, in addition to these three materials that have been computed by other, uh, I have shown you results for oxide and uh, these, these, these material, it all falls in this range. And then there are materials for which there are only small shifts, despite the fact that they might have light atoms, like hydrogen uh, or uh, also uh, oxygen. So this is lower than 0 0.2 uh, EV. So at, at this stage, um, one cannot know a priori in which class uh, some material will, will fall. Um, how much time do I have? <laughs> 10 minutes. Yes, okay. So I, I will go now uh, into something closely uh, related because indeed uh, we computed the spectral functions um, in order to obtain um, the, so we, we, we computed the self-energy in order to compute the, the, the band gap renormalization and also temperature dependence. And with self-energy, one can compute spectral uh, functions. And um, so the spectral function can be treated uh, and can be obtained either from um, the Dyson equation by doing a resummation of the Migdal or fan uh, self-energy. Well, for some reason in the literature one can speak of fan or Migdal self-energy. Uh, and then one will obtain the, um, uh, the spectral function by this expression that you have already seen uh, earlier. But such an approach is known to give only one satellite. Then we indeed computed uh, for the lithium fluoride, the self-energy, for the top of the, of the valence band. Um, so this is the 
uh, imaginary part, the real part of the self-energy, and the quasi particle P should appear where we have a crossing between this line and the uh, real part of the self-energy. The spectral function gives indeed a nice peak and one uh, satellite. The full uh, band structure was uh, computed at that time, and the satellite appears here, just below uh, the, the, the gamma point top of the valence uh, band. Um, and you see here the simple renormalization, uh, zero point normalization. The, the satellite is nearly, it's nearly impossible to, to see uh, it. But is this result uh, physical? Well, at that time we thought, okay, that's a good result. It might be possible to observe it in an uh, uh, experiment. Uh, but then, as was done by Feliciano uh, and Carla uh, uh, later, uh, this is actually not very uh, physical. Um, indeed, if one obtains the spectral function from a retarded cumulant uh, approach, in which one uh, resumes over many more diagrams, even approximately, and using uh, formulas that, as highlighted by Feliciano, uh, are not so much more complicated than uh, the previous treatment that uh, is highlighted here. Um, one will obtain something that uh, is more physical, and in particular, that has more than one uh, satellite. But is it indeed uh, physical also to obtain more than one satellite? When we computed, we recomputed recently uh, in this paper, uh, the spectral function of lithium fluoride, we were able to obtain nearly the same curve than here, but here we used uh, exquisitely converged uh, wave vector uh, grid. Uh, we obtained to so this quasi-particle peak, this satellite, uh, with more details here, but then our cumulant treatment gave basically this. There is not even one satellite, it's just a broad feature. So, what, what was happening here? Um, this is something that we clarified by looking at the spectral function with the Fröhlich uh, Hamiltonian. What is this Fröhlich Hamiltonian? Uh, it's considering only one band, actually, uh, so only intraband contribution, uh, parabolic with effective mass, only longitudinal optic phonons, those who are associated with the 1 over Q divergence. The frequency is taken constant with respect to Q. The electron phonon coupling will come from a macroscopically screen Coulomb interaction. All these hypotheses are actually correct for vanishing Q, but in the Frelich Hamiltonian, they are extended to the full pre -wenzel. Uh, for non-degenerate isotropic conduction of valence band extrema plus isotropic material, one can characterize the Fröhlich Hamiltonian in terms of one single parameter, which will be called the, 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 the strength of the electron phonon coupling, this quantity alpha. And very interestingly, the change in eigen energy due to uh, this electron phonon coupling is a simple uh, multiplication of this alpha by the LO frequency. And actually, this Frelich Hamiltonian works quite well. Uh, for lithium fluoride at the conduction band maximum, alpha can be estimated to be 4. The LO frequency is 83, oh, not MeV, it's 83, uh, well, uh, 83 MeV and not the 0, 0.0, it's an, it's an error here. And it happens that from Fröhlich one gets this uh, zero point normalization, and from first principle one gets this value of the zero point normalization. So actually, the zero point normalization in strongly polar material is dominated by the Fröhlich uh, Hamiltonian. This was actually known by uh, non first principle. Uh, 
uh, people for several decades, but kind of the, this knowledge has not per permeated to the first principle community, neither to Allen and Heine at the time of the, uh, of the 80s. Then for the valence band uh, uh, maximum, the alpha is quite large, 8 to 15. And from first principle, we obtain indeed something that is uh, much larger. Altogether, it's on the order of one EV. Then what is happening in the Fröhlich model? When the alpha is very small, the quasi-particle peak is lower than the zero by alpha times the LO frequency. So this shift is directly proportional to this quantity. And then the satellite is distinct by the quasi-particle peak by exactly one LO phonon frequency, which is the right physics. Huh? There is indeed an excited state, which compared to the quasi-particle ground state somehow has one more phonon. Whether where it might be, I don't know. It's just a phonon that is not linked to the, to the electron. Hmm? In the GW approximation or this uh, MIGDAL uh, approach to the self-energy, the satellite is here. The one single satellite is there. You see that the distance is not the correct one. Now, turning on the alpha to four, one gets this thing in the cumulant. And one get this thing in the the uh, the, uh, the Migdal uh, approach: one quasi-particle peak and one satellite. You see that even despite the fact that we clearly see the peak, they all start to broaden quite widely. And then, when alpha is equal to eight, we simply get one broad feature without the possibility to have satellites being uh, seen. That's why uh, we had this problem. Uh, in, in our spectral function. Um, again, the Fröhlich and first principle calculation agree very well and much better than uh, the Migdal approach, Dyson Migdal approach. And one can show that um, actually comparing with the diagrammatic Monte Carlo data uh, for this Fröhlich model, one can see that the Dyson Migdal approach has a wrong behavior while the simple Raleigh Schrodinger approach or the cumulative approach has a much better uh, energy behavior, also in terms of the quasi particle uh, weight. But still, the correct position of the satellites might be uh, debated. Uh, at this stage, I read something in which we still have many uncertainties and things that we do not understand uh, uh, very well. So I will skip this thing and go to my conclusion. Um, so in order to obtain the temperature dependence of the electronic structure, there might be many effects to include. Thermal expansion was cited, the fan contribution, the debye waller contribution, but doing uh, adiabatic approach is not very good for polar uh, material, so one has to go to dynamical self-energy. One might have to include anharmonicities beyond, uh, especially for materials that are weakly uh, uh, bound, like Van der Waals uh, solid. There might be an effect linked to the non-rigid non ion behavior, and also the starting point might play uh, a role, either at the simple level of the electronic structure, but also for the electron phonon coupling, as I have uh, uh, described. Um, the sampling of phonon wave vector might be a serious issue. The adiabatic quadratic approximation can break down, but we know how to treat it nowadays. The zero point normalization effect might be 0 0.2 to 2 EV when light elements are present. And finally, uh, I have presented some recent results about the uh, spectral functions, and I will stop now and of course, answer your questions. Thank you for your attention.